king, that he is meek and mild, that he came for us. Let's sing to our king today. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow. Every chain will break His open arms declare His praise Who can stop the Lord? celebrate that together church you may be seated hey good morning everybody how you doing yeah are you glad it's Sunday man I, I look forward to Sunday every week I'm already ready for the next Sunday right hey glad that you're here it is an exciting day to be at First Baptist Richardson uh, we're gonna worship together we're gonna sing together uh, we're gonna study God's Word uh, we're gonna baptize this morning uh, so it is a great day to celebrate. God is doing some incredible things here. Uh, and so we're excited, excited that you, if you're a guest, just want to say welcome. We're glad that you have chosen to worship with us. Uh, and we want to connect with you. We want to know that you're here, know a little bit about you. Uh, we want to tell you a little bit about us. 
uh, and how we might be able to serve you and your family. So you should have received a bulletin when you walked in. Uh, on the bottom of that, there's a Connect card. Uh, you can fill that out. You know, later on, we're going to pass the offering plate as we give our tithes and offerings to the Lord, and you can place it in there as well. Or Also, we have a Next Step room that you'll hear more about later, and you can bring that over there, and we'll be happy to connect with you and answer any questions you have about our church, uh, about the Trinity, uh, about salvation, or about cowboy football, right? Yeah? Probably rather answer the Trinity question than the Dallas Cowboy question. But glad that you're here with us. If you're joining us online, especially glad to have you here today. Thank you very much. I uh, just want to let you know, next week, we're going to mix things up a little bit. I know you guys are kind of used to a certain kind of format on Sunday morning, uh, and so we're going to blow that up. Next Sunday, uh, for several weeks in September, I'm going to kind of change up how I'm doing the message. So next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching at the first part of our celebration service. And then when I finish there, I'm going to come over here and preach the second half of this service. So we'll have worship at the first, and then I'll come in and preach. Then the next Sunday, I'll flip that. Uh, I'll be preaching here the first part, and then I'll walk across the hallway to preach in celebration. I'm going to do that for a few weeks just because I want to be in every room. So we'll have live preaching in every service. It's just going to be me. So I don't know what that means for you uh, or, or how you see that. But so just kind of get familiar with you and, and spend time in worship with you guys want to do that. And so just be ready for it. Uh, if you get confused, uh, so will I. So don't worry about it. Uh, but also there are a lot of things happening in our church. And so to help keep you better informed, watch this scoop video. Welcome to worship. I'm Joanne Isaacson and I have the scoop for you today. Last year, we hosted Feed My Starving Children Mobile Pack. We packed over 350,000 meals for starving children around the world. And we're gonna do it again, September 20th and 21st. And we have designated Friday night as FBCR night. And we have 160 spots that we are holding for you. And you can sign up by texting FEED to the church number. If that doesn't work for you, or you wanna do more than one shift, or you want to bring all your friends. There are two shifts on Saturday. Go to fbcr.org missions for all the details. And while you're there, you can find out about our new missionary care teams. These are teams who will assist in the role of caring and communicating with our mission partners. Join us for lunch on September 15th to get more information. We're gonna have a group going on mission trip to New York in October. We will be partnering with City Relief and setting up prayer stations. Will you join me on this trip? If you have questions, come visit us at the Mission Wall after worship today. Wow, What's on Wednesdays will be kicking off September 11th. There is something for everyone. The Missional Living 101 class this term looks at Christ's strategy for evangelism. And if you haven't taken Finding My Place class yet, maybe this is the time for you. It will look at your spiritual gifts and interests to find ministries and service opportunities that are a good fit for you. Go to fbcr.org slash Wednesdays for the full lineup and to register. Finally, guys, we have the first men's gathering this Saturday with our special guest speaker, Pastor Ronnie. Text men to register. That's it for today, and I hope you have a great day. All right, as you can tell, there's a lot going on in our church, a lot of ways for you to be engaged in ministry. Uh, and so I'm going to invite Blake Lewis to come up. He's going to lead us in our offertory prayers. He comes up. Just want to say thank you for your generosity and giving of your finances to our church. Uh, because you give, I just found out we have a ministry that feeds the homeless. Uh, I walked into the kitchen last week, and there were like 2,000 baked potatoes sitting on a table uh, in this team. And so they do that, and they go out and feed the homeless. And so I thought that was cool. Because you give, we're able to do things like that plus more. So would you lead us in our prayer, please, sir? Thank you, Blake. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today to, to share, to learn, to fellowship, to experience the Holy Spirit. 
Bless us now for the gifts that we're going to give, that they may further our mission and enable us to be the light of the world that you ask us to be. These things I pray in your name. Amen. Thank you. 
about his holiness I can't help but think about the throne that's described in Revelation and the angels gathering around and, and declaring together worthy and holy is the Lord so let's join them this morning as we consider our great God and all that Christ has done Be 
for the name of God and say you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things and to you are all things. You deserve the be our response to him. Father, we pray that that would be true of us. Lord, we are quick to confess that 
It is so easy for us to allow things to crowd you out. So Father, what we sang earlier, that we might make room for, for Christ, because Lord, we see all that you have done for us. And it is an unimaginable sacrifice and depth and glory that we celebrate. So help us now as we learn from your word that we would draw near to your heart, that your spirit would move in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, church family. It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord, and also a good morning to you in Worship East. Uh, but it is an extra special day on Sunday when we get to baptize somebody. And so I want to introduce you to Gary Osiris. Gary's been visiting our church for a number of weeks now and wants to join our church family by baptism. And uh, Gary's family is all in Florida. So they're not here today, but they're looking forward to seeing this uh, in the recorded version on our website. And uh, so, Gary, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Gary, because of your public profession that Jesus Christ is now Lord of your life, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. And we thank you for, uh, for Gary. We thank you for the new journey that he's on. Uh, just pray that he would worship and follow you all the days of his life. And as his church family, that we would support him in every way possible along that journey. Be with the rest of this service. Thank you for the blessings of this church. We love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good morning. Man, pretty cool, huh? You guys realize we baptized the last three out of four Sundays, right? Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus still saves, right? Yeah. Hey, worship leaders, thank you guys today. Awesome. You know what? You look like you enjoy what you do. Yeah? Thank you for smiling when you sing. Yeah? All right. Good job. Beautiful job. Yeah. Uh, glad that you are here this morning. Uh, got to say hi to the folks over in Worship East. So they're uh, worshiping along with us, watching via satellite uh, from a remote location. <laughs> as well as you joining online. So it's, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, we started this life series, if you remember, or with us last week. Uh, we started talking about basically what the scripture says should be expected of every family member in the church. What are the things that we are expected to do? What are the things that, that we at First Richardson expect our members to be a part of? And so basically just walking through the acrostic of life, love God, invest in people, fellowship with believers, and engage the culture. So last week we talked about worship. When the, the first step or a next step for you to demonstrate your love for God is to gather in corporate worship. I believe it is vital. The scripture says it is important for us to be together. Uh, we need to worship together. We are not an island unto ourselves. There's just something energetic about worshiping together, something contagious, something beneficial. Uh, I realize not everyone's able to join with us, but if, if we can make it, we want to be here together to celebrate with the family. We talked about worship. What is worship? Worship is our response to God's goodness uh, for who he is, uh, not even for what he's done yet. We know he's going to do great things, but just, again, if God stopped blessing us right now, we'd have enough to praise him for eternity. That's how good he is, and that's how good he has been. And talked about some of the temptation that we have in worship, that it becomes more about feeling than, than our mind. But we know that worship involves our heart. It is an emotional experience. But it's also an intellectual experience. We worship based on what we know about God as he has revealed himself to us and continues to reveal himself more and more. So it's, it's not that we come to worship so we can feel good. Now, that's a byproduct, and that's a blessing when that happens. But even if we don't feel good, <laughs> we can worship him. Even in the midst of the storm, we can worship him because it's what we know to be true about God that enables us, encourages us to praise and worship him. He is a good guy. Amen? 
He loves us beyond our ability to understand it. He is patient. He is forgiving. And he is a great God. And so it's just an opportunity that we have and an honor to be able to worship him. He has revealed himself to us, which is amazing when you think about it. The one who has created all things, the all-powerful one, yet he chose to reveal himself to us to give us the greatest message of all time, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. He's entrusted that with us. He's entrusted his church to be a light in a dark world, to be the voice of truth and reason and to do it with love. It's phenomenal when you consider what God has called us to do as a church. And so out of that understanding, we want to worship him. The Bible says that worship, honoring God, is our number one priority. It's why we were created, to bring glory to his name. And so today we're going to talk about the I in life. And this is invest in people. And so, yes, yes, it is. Yes, this is a giving sermon. So, I know what you're thinking. Wow, he just got here, and he's already <laughs> preaching about money. <laughs> gutsy, right? Pretty gutsy. Uh, yeah, I told you, it's not going to be the same. We're going to talk about that because it's important. The Bible has a lot to say about how we treat our finances and how we bless others and bless the Lord with our money. So, when you think about I, investing in people, we do that two ways. One is relational. As a Christ follower, you have Holy Spirit gifts that have been given to you or given to you at the point of salvation. The intent of those gifts is to advance the kingdom of God, to enhance his church. It's not for your glory. It's not for your fame. It is for his name. And so by using those gifts, you contribute relationally, invest relationally in the lives of others, not just here in our church, but also in our community. You saw in the scoop video some of the things that we're doing that just touch it's the tip of the iceberg of all the things that we're doing to connect to our community, to engage our community, to engage our culture. But that's part of how we invest in people, sharing the gospel, living out the gospel in our lives so others can come to know Christ. The second thing we do to invest is by giving, by giving of our finance. You know it takes money to run ministry, right? It takes money to have lights on and screens and have all the beautiful, and have air conditioning. <laughs> Uh, which we didn't have a whole lot of uh, last few weeks. So all this stuff takes money. Let's just be honest about that. So we're able to do these things. We're able to meet together because people are generous. So this morning, I want, I want to look at Scripture and what does it say to us on how we can create an environment, a culture of generosity. As Christians, we should be the most generous people on the planet because of what we have received. Amen? Amen. Because of God's continued faithfulness and goodness, we should be, should have the posture of being the most generous people on the planet. Uh, so if you have your Bible, I invite you to open to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to look at a story that includes Paul uh, and a very giving church, although they didn't have very much in worldly standards, yet they were willing to give. So talking about this idea of investing people. Now, I just want to be honest and upfront. I believe wholeheartedly the Bible teaches the principle of tithing. Heavy in the Old Testament, I know the word is not necessarily found in the New Testament, but the concept is, but I, I don't think that it stopped in the New Testament. The Bible says that tithe is a 10% of our income. That is obedience. All right? When we give, that is an act of obedience to the Father. It's an act of faith. No doubt there's other things we could do with that money. But it won't be, it won't go as far, it won't make a difference as it will when we give to God's kingdom. So I believe in tithing, and I believe in offerings. So offerings are above and beyond the tithe. There are occasions and times that we are called upon to give above. One of the things that reminds us and demonstrates that we know that everything we have comes from the Lord. It's not just our income, it's not just our check, everything we have. And he is the giver of good gifts, right? He is a good, good father. Come on, can I get an amen on that? Yes. He gives good gifts, and so it's an honor to be able to return. And he's just asking for a 10 percent, just a small amount. But it demonstrates faith, it demonstrates love, and it demonstrates care. So it is a powerful thing that we do. But I understand not everybody's there, right? Not everybody's ready to jump into that. Some of us, honestly, as church members, aren't giving anything to our church. And so I want to challenge you today. Before I get into the message, I want to challenge you. If you're not giving anything, just start giving something today. I know we've already passed the place, but we can find more, right? Just start giving something. If you are giving something, but you're not quite to that 10%, then take that step of faith and jump on up to 10%. 
If you're giving something, you've noticed that God has not let you down. God has not abandoned you. But move to that tithe, giving 10%, at least 10%. To me, 10% is a floor. It's where we start. But I know that not everyone's there yet. So give something. Then move towards that tithe. If you're tithing, consider giving above and beyond the tithe abundantly as the Lord asks of you to give above and beyond your tithe to be generous. So those three steps, I think, can help us understand, hopefully give us some framework as we look at the scriptures this morning of what was going on. It's been said about our lives that, that we can either waste them, we can spend them, or we can invest them. Now, the wise move is to invest with our talents, with our time, with our treasures, these things we can invest. Now, if you're an investor, when you invest something, you expect to receive some dividends. You expect to see some results, right? There is no greater thing in which we can invest outside of the church of God. When we invest, it has results. Now, it may not make you rich. There's a thing out there called the prosperity gospel, prosperity doctrine that is not of the Bible. It is not the concept. If you get 10 cents, God, 10 cents God's going to give you $1,000. That's not how the Bible teaches us. If you give a little bit, you plant a seed of faith, and God will make you rich. God will make you healthy. If you're not healthy or not rich, then there's something wrong with your faith. That's not true. If that were the case, Jesus would not have much faith. So don't buy into this prosperity doctrine. But the Bible says a lot about the importance of giving of what we have, giving of our possessions, giving of our finances, and giving of our time. Because you invest in First Baptist Richardson, exciting things happen. Feed my starving children. Uh, I, I just wrote down some stats. Uh, apparently, this last time we were involved in that, we were able to be a part of sending out 350,000 meals to starving children. 350,000 meals. Uh, this past week, I walked into the kitchen. I smelled baked potatoes. Whenever I smell food, I follow it, right? I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm excited. And so there were like thousands of baked potatoes on these tables because I discovered that we, we feed the homeless from our church. We go out to the streets and we feed homeless because you give, we're able to do that. When you invest your money, we, we are reaching, we get to baptize people. When, when you invest money into the kingdom of God through First Baptist Richardson, it makes a difference. It makes a difference in families. We reach children, we reach students, we, we reach international students. We support missionaries all over the world. When you invest your money, it pays great dividends for eternal significance. It is an act of our worship to God. It is an investment that goes far beyond whatever you and I can manufacture with that money, with those gifts. It blesses the kingdom. And you know what? The Father notices. <laughs> the Father notices when we are obedient to give to Him. It's an act of praise and an act of worship. In our passage today, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the Christians in Corinth. And he wants to inspire them in this idea of giving to help support his ministry and other ministries and the church might grow. And he uses a story to illustrate the importance of giving. And he talks about the Macedonians. And the Macedonians, that they're, they're what we would say in our vernacular, they are dirt poor. Yet they love to give. And they gave abundantly. Not maybe on the worldwide scale, but in percentage and proportion to what they had and what they gave, it was overwhelming. It was inspiring. And so Paul uses this to challenge the Corinthian Christians. So if you have your Bible, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me read the first four verses, again, reading from the Christian Standard Bible. This is what Paul writes. When we want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia... During a severe trial brought about by affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. I can testify that according to their ability and even beyond their ability of their own accord, they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of the saints. Wow, what a start. <laughs> what an encouragement. They begged to be able to give. Wouldn't that be awesome if everyone in our church begged to be able to give finances to bless the kingdom of God and advance the ministries of his church? 
And so that may not mean a lot to you, but when you understand the poverty, extreme poverty, he said it, 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 both their joy and their poverty overflows. So one of the principles we see from this church in Macedonia is that generosity produces joy. Joy comes from generosity. As we are generous people, there is joy in that. God loves a cheerful giver, right? When that offering plate comes by, we should get excited because we have an opportunity to invest. We have an opportunity to play a part. When Greg accepted Christ and we just baptized him, because you give, you played a part in that. When we go out and feed homeless, you may not be able to go out with them, but because you invest, you have a part in that. What you see God doing here, you have a part because you invest in what God is doing. And you love this church, right? We want to see this church alive and thriving and impactful. We want to be part of an impactful church. So it's a joy to be able to support that. We can't all go, but we can all give. We can all pray. There are things that we can all do that are necessary and vital for us to be able to do what God has called us to do. The Macedonian church loved to give even though they were under persecution. What's well, interesting, neither their poverty nor their joy was diminished because of their giving. This verse right here shatters the prosperity doctrine. They gave, they were still dirt poor. God didn't pour out thousands of dollars, denarii, none of that, but there was something different. So it paid a dividend that was different. It was an emotion. It was a confidence that they had. It was a joy. You know any miserable people in this world? And tell them to start giving, right? That's a joke, not really, but there's plenty of unhappiness. So you mean I can give of part of my possessions and that produces joy? Yes, that's what the Bible is teaching us here. Because it's obviously these Christians had a, a different worldview. Their faith in God was strong, even though they were still poor. One of the things Robin and I love to do, we love to travel. We've been all over the world. Most recent, the last two trips, we were able to go once to Africa and once to India. And we were in the remote parts of these countries, beautiful countries, beautiful people. And the experiences were the same, in ex extreme poverty, which we had never seen before. But their joy and their generosity was amazing. We would go into their homes, eight by eight homes, dirt floors, one little burner to cook their food, a couple of bunk beds, eight to 10 people living in this space, no front door, maybe a chair or a couch, very, very minimal. And we would walk in and they would put a, a lay of flowers over our neck, fresh flowers, there are a lot of flowers in those countries. They would pour us chai tea, some of the best chai tea I've ever had on this planet, and I love chai tea, hot, and they would offer us snacks. These people had nothing, but they were so excited and so hospitable that they gave above and beyond to try to bless us. And it would be an insult if we didn't take it. And so we took it, because again, I love chai tea. <laughs> but that was just overwhelming. I mean, I, everywhere we went, every church service we went, every home we went into, it was the same thing over and over again. I was speechless at their generosity. But they had a different spirit. They understood what was important. And their desire was to make us feel at home and feel welcome, though we were thousands of miles from our home. This is what Paul's describing for us, the mindset of the Macedonians. They had their priorities in line. They knew what was important, so they wanted to give. So generosity is not dependent on significant resources. It's not really dependent on what you and I have. It's really more a matter of our heart. It's a matter of our faith. Do we trust the Lord? If I give this away, God will take care of me. Has he not been faithful always to take care of us, even when we give? But it is more blessed to give than to receive. Surely we know this by now. We've been doing this a long time. Surely we understand this importance. And joy is produced through generosity in the middle of the storm. 
think about this, to have joy in the midst of the storm. You guys, we've kind of been through a hurricane season recently. I, we remember Hurricane Harvey and some of the big ones that have hit. And if you've ever studied hurricanes, what's amazing about a hurricane, you have these violent winds of 150, 160, 200 miles an hour, but the eye of the storm is calm. There is peace in the middle of the storm. It's an amazing phenomenon of how this happens. But in the center, there is peace and calm. This is the life of the believer, that we can experience joy in the midst of crisis because we know that our life is not based on our circumstances. It's not based on our wealth. Our identity and our worth is not based on what we have, but based on who we know. And the God of the universe says you are valuable to him. Whether you have a little or you have a lot, the key is, what do we do with what the Lord has blessed us? So look at verse 5. Paul goes on. And not just as we had hoped. Instead, they gave themselves first to the Lord, then to us by God's will. Key step there. First to the Lord, then to us by God's will. So we urge Titus that just as he had begun, so he should also complete among you this act of grace. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, speech, knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, excel also in this act of grace. Paul refers to this as grace giving. Giving out of the grace and the abundance of our God. Generosity is our response to grace. We have been saved by grace. These Christians beg to be able to give to the Christians in Jerusalem who are going, undergoing persecution, undergoing difficult time. These were Gentiles wanting to give money to help Jews. So we see their generosity produced joy, and it was a response to God's grace. The generosity broke down every kind of social, socioeconomic, racial, ethnic boundary. Their generosity crossed all kinds of lines. They were Gentiles who wanted to give to Jews, who Jews who used to consider Gentiles lower than dogs. There was great prejudice, great animosity against these groups of people, but Christ did something. Christ transformed them, and so they wanted to give to help those who were in need, who once were considered their enemies. Now they're their brothers and sisters. That's the beauty of God's grace, right? And so out of that, they wanted to support so what this shows us when we invest our money through our church, it shows that we care for one another. I love, one of the things I love about First Richardson, we don't all look alike. Some of you say, praise the Lord, <laughs> all right? We don't all look alike, we don't all act alike, we don't all come from the same backgrounds. We're not all, always, all Dallas Cowboy fans, which we've talked about that before, right? So we're different. It's, it's a beautiful picture of the church. And what binds us together is the Holy Spirit of God. And what connects us even deeper is our generosity to one another. That we are willing to give so that no one is in need. That everyone has their needs met through our giving. Again, Paul calls this grace giving. The Jews refer to giving as an act of righteousness. Because we have a right standing before God, and he pours out his favor into our lives, we have the ability to be able to give. And when we give, it's a reflection that we have received and experienced the grace of God. It is truly grace giving. And we have experienced that, and so we want to give. And it's really that grace of God that motivates us to give. Because there are always needs, and we can't meet every need that's out there, but our God can and so since we've experienced that and seen that and, and demonstrated that, we want to be able to give because to promote his grace. A man by the name of Ebeth made this statement. If giving loses its origin and purpose in God and his grace, both it and our faith will shriver, shrivel and die. Martin Luther said this, I've held many things in my hands and I've lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Right? To give it away, put it in God's hands that he can use it so much more than we can, so much more effectively than you and I could ever do with the money that we have. Look at verse 8 and 9 of chapter 8. I'm not saying this as a command 
Rather, by means of the diligence of others, I am testing the genuineness of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Although it's not mentioned here, you see the image of the cross in Paul's words. As he's reminding us that Jesus was rich. He was in heaven, streets of gold, everything perfect. He left all of that to become poor. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He left the glory and riches of heaven to come be one of us to point us to the Father. He left all the riches to become poor because that's how valuable we are to the Father. And he can, became poor so that you and I can be rich. Again, he's not talking about earthly riches. He's talking about eternal riches. Jesus made that sacrifice. Jesus invested it all so that we could have life abundant and eternal. How can we not give as an act of grace, as an act of obedience, as an act of worship? When you consider what Jesus did for us, is that not our response to be generous to him and to his church and to his people? He has made us rich. And he gave it all on the cross for us. So in some sense, when you consider that, when we give, when we are generous, we imitate Jesus. We demonstrate what Jesus did. We, we act like Jesus. When we give of our finances, we give of our tithes and our offerings, we give that image of Jesus to an unbelieving world. Then Paul goes on in verse 10. And in this matter, I'm giving advice because it's profitable for you who began last year not only to do something, but also wanted to do it. Now also finish the task so that just as there was an eager desire, there may be a completion according to what you have. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. It is not that there should be relief for others and hardship for you, but it is a question of equality. At the present time of your surplus is available for their need so that their abundance may in turn meet your need in order that there may be equality. As it is written, the person who had much did not have too much, and the person who had little did not have too little. The other thing about generosity is it builds community. Some of us have a lot more than others, right? But that's the beauty of the church. When we give, we all receive, and that brings equality. We are a family. And our family has needs. And so we give of ourselves. And honestly, we give of an abundance. That's why I really challenge every Christ follower to go on an international mission trip to a third world country at some point in their life. Because one of the things that's going to happen when you come back, you're going to get rid of a lot of junk. <laughs> when you realize the excess that we have, we don't understand poverty. There are some poor people in this country, I know, but not like you see in other countries. Every one of us, we are rich in the eyes of the world. And even if we don't consider ourselves rich, it's still an opportunity to give and to bless through generosity. Generosity knows no boundaries. Again, because of the saving faith of Jesus Christ, the Macedonian Christians and the Corinthian Christians and the Jerusalem Christians, they saw themselves as one body. In different parts, doing different things, but all relying on one another. It was a beautiful demonstration of the church. Paul also gives us a principle here that generosity, generous giving, should be systematic, should be proportional, should be sacrificial. Those who had much didn't have too much. Those who had little didn't have too little. So everyone had equality. Everyone's built community there. But it's a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice to give. Again, there's something else we could do with that money or those possessions or our time or our talents, but nothing will have eternal investment unless we invest it in the church. But we should plan our giving, not on a whim. I served in a church one time. We had a couple that was friends of ours, and they were visiting. They were of a different denomination, uh, and they came. And the, the guy, the husband was kind of a tight one. He was a little tight with money. And so uh, as the offering plate came by, he put a $20 bill in the plate. And his wife was amazed. He never lets go of a 20. And so after the service, he said, well, what, what compelled you to give money to the offering? He said, well, I thought it was a pretty good show this morning. <laughs> and I just wanted a tip. 
Hey, we can't live off tips. Especially if you're hoping to get tips off the sermon. That's just not going to happen, all right? So it's not just on a whim. Now, there are times that the Holy Spirit moves and we, we feel compelled to give in the moment, but it needs to be planned out. It needs to be budgeted. It needs to be thought out ahead of time. Still a beautiful act, a beautiful way to worship the Lord. Again, there are times when needs arise and we need to step up. In COVID, I know we saw the church, many churches gave above and beyond. They overseeded their budget, even though it had already been planned through COVID, through a difficult time. Why? Because there's faith. There's belief. There's a need that arises, and God's people stand up. This offering demonstrated unity. Look at chapter 9, verse 6 through 8. The point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap, reap generously. Each person should do as he decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. What a beautiful demonstration of the church. The other thing about generosity, it reveals maturity. I, I've never met a mature, maturing Christian who is not faithful in giving. It does result, it is a part of being a mature Christ follower. It's the principle of the harvest. Sow a little, reap a little. Sow a lot, reap a lot. It's the investment of the kingdom. Again, doesn't mean you're going to get rich. It's not what it's saying. When you're faithful to give. So Paul's saying, don't be stingy. <laughs> Don't hoard your money. Don't hang on to it because it's not who you are. It doesn't identify you. It's more blessed to give than to receive. But he says, but give out a conviction. Pray about it. I would say don't pray very long, but pray about it, right? Because we know it's the right thing to do. In fact, the word generosity in original language means upon blessing. So upon the blessings that I have received, I can be generous with what God has given me, that I might bless others. Give with the right motives. Again, not to get rich. Never give to receive, although we will receive. But the goal really ultimately is to give thanksgiving to our God. The motivation to give generously to God is that God will do more with the gift given than you and I could ever imagine. We always talk about we want to change the world. Changing the world really is all about God. <laughs> He's the only one who can really change the world. But we can play a part by giving. So here's the challenge I have for you. That you invest your time, you invest your talents, and you invest your treasure in First Baptist Richardson. That we may be able to carry out the God-sized vision that he is giving us to do immeasurably more than you and I could ever think or imagine. And we will celebrate and we will rejoice because the Father has allowed us to be a part. So we have made it hopefully very easy for you to be able to fulfill the challenge to give to the Lord. You can give in different ways. You can give as we pass the offering plate. You could put money in there as you do that. We have giving boxes placed throughout our campus. You can put your money in there. You can give online at fbc.org slash give. You can text GIVE to 972-235-5296. Uh, you can mail to the church office. We try to be very user-friendly when it comes to the ability to give to God's church. So whatever way you choose, that's great. But I just want to challenge you to consider if you've not given anything to our church, or if you're giving your time thinking that replaces your treasure, I want to challenge you to start to give something financially. If you're already doing that then, and you're not up to the 10%, I want to challenge you to take that step, 10% of your income. You will not be sorry. 
you will not regret doing that. If you're already tithing, consider, Lord, do you want me to give above and beyond? Ask the Lord what he would have you to give, and he will tell you a promise. Let's pray. Father, you are the giver of all good things. You have blessed each of us immensely, even though we are undeserving. Yet because you are love, you pour out your love, you pour out your resources. Our inheritance is heaven. We have glory, but we don't have to wait. Father, you bless us with abundance even now. God, I believe the sign of a healthy church is when we see more and more families committed to giving to your kingdom. We believe this is a healthy place and we want to get even healthier. So God, I pray that you would challenge and convict us through your Holy Spirit in the area of giving. That we would truly, each of us, honest, just think and, and ask you, contemplate, meditate for a moment on what you would have us to give and may we respond in obedience to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us for worship today. We would love to pray for you. Text the word pray to the church number and join us again next week in person or online.